Good evening, first of all. And <laughs> it's called state and capital in the era of primitive accumulation because I think the state has been by and large missing from the, from the discussion and needs to be brought back in in some way. In the second posthumous volume of Sartre's masterpiece, The Critique of Dialectical Reason, which is largely given over to the attempt to make deeper sense of Russia's industrial expansion under Stalin, that is to the problem of how a command economy works, Sartre explains that the best history is defined as a synthetic movement, or what he calls totalizing compression. He writes, two dialectical procedures are possible on the basis of an identical social reality. On the one hand, a procedure of decompressive expansion, which starts off from the object to arrive at everything. In this case, thought may be called detotalizing, and the event loses out to the signified ensemblers. On the other hand, a procedure of totalizing compression, which by contrast grasps the centripetal movement of all the significations attracted and condensed in the event or in the object. I want to suggest in this lecture that we need to integrate Marx's notion of primitive accumulation into a wider history of capitalism that allows for the combined nature of its evolution. And that one way of doing this is to treat primitive accumulation as one of those, quote, practical significations or signified ensembles or structures that form a permanent dimension of capitalism. This means breaking with the linearity of the simplified model of primitive accumulation that many Marxists still subscribe to with its stagism, if you like, and with the strong resonance of teleology that usually goes with that. Retrospective readings of capitalism start with large-scale industry and imagine that primitive accumulation explains how that came about. But if there's a sense in which this may account for Britain's industrial primacy, it's hard to see how it would, quote, explain most other industrial trajectories which were in any case influenced by Britain's own expansion, either correlatively as with India or by negation as, in, as with Britain's main industrial competitors. In a critique of Marx's pages, Gershenkron made a great deal of this point, noting that the bank-financed industrial expansion that occurred in Germany did not presuppose anything like the protracted processes Marx had described. But if my general suggestion is accepted, the obvious question, of course, is what wider history? I mean, in other words, do we have a history of capitalism? <coughs> Do we have categories for that? And how exactly do we see primitive accumulation fitting into this broader canvas? It may help to start by dispelling possible misconceptions. At the level of national capitals, there is no inevitability which says that primitive accumulation will always succeed. So we've got numerous cases of failed primitive accumulation. The Spanish mercantilists such as Alberto Struzzi and Sancho de Moncada were relentless in their criticisms of Spain's backwardness. Spain in the later 16th and 17th centuries offers a striking demonstration of the failure of primitive accumulation, precisely because nothing was as emblematic of this, quote, original accumulation as Spain's amassing of American treasure and the pure predation and brutality involved in the way that was done. And we've had papers dealing with that this, earlier this, today. Spain amassed gold and silver, but failed to convert this accumulated mass of precious metals into capital. Thus, Moncada urged Spain to emulate France and Holland, countries without mines, in which, because of industry and active commerce, gold and silver abounded. And the naturalized Spaniard Struzzi wrote in 1624, it's absurd to expect money to stay in Spain. It is needed in trade. The Dutch and others pay for goods in money, but it then returns to them by other parts through trade. There is no nation rich without trade. For primitive accumulation to have succeeded, Stutzi was telling his readers, Spain would have had to have had a class of commercial capitalists strong enough to match the competition of the Dutch and others. Yet if we look at the Mediterranean as a whole, the two regions where no substantial class of indigenous capitalists ever emerged, at least not in a serious way, were precisely the great empires ruled over by the Spanish Habsburgs and the Ottomans, including cities like Naples that were under Spanish rule. 
all all the capitalists in in in, in Naples were essentially foreign capitalists. I mean, they dominated the olive oil trade in the in the 18th century. Secondly, the amassing of a large capital stock, even in the more advanced countries, was not a sufficient condition of industrial capitalism. In the Netherlands in the 18th century, rapidly accumulating stocks of capital led, in fact, to the financial sector becoming an important sector of the economy in its own right, as Jan de Vries tells us. Here, of the large capital stock amassed by a century of profitable expansion, little new investment found its way into industry. It flowed instead into doubling the size of the VOC, that's the East India Company, in the face of new competition from the French and the English, into establishing a Caribbean plantation economy, and into a new type of whaling enterprise, which faced higher capital requirements as the whaling grounds retreated further north. In the case of England, Christopher Hiller had asked, where did the capital for the Industrial Revolution come from? And replied, spectacularly large sums flowed into England from overseas from the slave trade, and especially from the 1760s, from organized looting of India. Yet Hill went on to make the point, quote, it is not always easy to trace, connect, to trace connections so directly. There is not much evidence that the plunder of India flowed directly into industry. Much of it was spent on conspicuous consumption and on buying political immunity for the plunderers. This puts paid to Marx's implied suggestion that the plunder of Bengal by the servants of the East India Company, who legally engaged in private trade, was directly instrumental to industrial expansion in Britain. In East Indian fortunes, Marshall calculated that three million pounds was sent home before 1757 and about 15 million over the 27 years between 1757 and 1784. That's from Bengal alone. But notes about those who returned to Britain from Bengal Few regarded their fortunes as capital for further venturing in trade or manufacturing in Britain. So it's as if a kind of river is beginning to emerge, but it runs dry. That's the narrow sense in which many non-Marxist scholars, economists more than historians, understand primitive accumulation, namely as the accumulation of capitals which are then channeled into industrial development, is a misconception of the broader sense in which Marx understood this this particular dimension of capitalism's history. Primitive accumulation was viewed by him, and this has been said n number of times through the last two days, was viewed by Marx both as a long and violent history of dispossession, of what he called the terrible expropriation of the great mass of people from the soil, and as a process of consolidation of capital. Much of Marx's attention was of course given to the first side of this long, quote, prehistory of capital, but chapter 31, which deals with the consolidation of capital, alludes to a very wide range of topics that include colonial trade and the colonial system, public finance, indirect taxation, commercial wars, protectionism, child labor, and the slave trade. However, the overall impression a reader comes away with is that primitive accumulation was, to Marx's mind, a sort of long prehistory of industrial capitalism. That's kind of the first impression I got when I first read those parts of volume one, a long prehistory of industrial capitalism as this had developed by the 1860s. The main drawback of this model in this, in this stark form is its linearity. Centuries of violence and dispossession and of states intervening to consolidate capital are followed in the way Marx tells this story by the eventual triumph of large scale industry. But the fact that Marx's last chapter dealt with Wakefield suggests that he extended this narrative into the 19th century to include settler colonialism in his history of primitive accumulation at a time when Britain at least was widely thought to be suffering from a quote superfluity or over accumulation of capital. And following this cue, I want to suggest a more complex or combined history of capitalism that allows, as I said, for the simultaneity of capitalism and primitive accumulation. In fact, the background to Wakefield's colonization schemes was over accumulation of capital. There was too much capital in Britain. And a, a good example of this particular method of the simultaneity of capitalism and primitive accumulation, is, of course, is the way Rosa Luxemburg deals with Russia's industrial expansion in uh, accumulation of capital. To allow for this history of capitalism, however, we shall need to establish a clear distinction between two forms or determinations of form that Marx himself tends to either conflate or to ignore. Marx saw manufacture and the manufacturing period 
as signifying the emergence of industrial capital. In an interesting passage of the Grundrisse, which I shall return to, the period of mercantilism is described as, quote, an epoch when, where industrial capital and hence wage labor arose in manufactures. Now, it's true that in the 17th century, industrial production acquired new enhanced significance. For example, in the writings of those who saw state-supported production of manufactured exports as the most effective way of securing surpluses on the current account and the best form of a mercantilist policy. But stated the way Marx does, this ignores the fact that these were largely merchant-controlled enterprises. As late as the 18th century, luxury goods industries, such as the Lyon silk industry, were dominated by merchant capital, by the so-called marchand fabricant, studied by Carlo Poni in one remarkable paper. The, these fir those firms used the putting out system and a battery of designers to generate the sort of flexibility that allowed them to dominate the European fashion market to the despair of competitors in England and Italy. In fact, as early as 1929, Henry Hauser had signaled the distinction involved here by writing, quote, at the end of the 15th century, new industries appeared, the children of the Renaissance, war industries like the production of guns, luxury industries like silk, intellectual industries like printing, type making and paper making. It would perhaps be premature to speak of industrial capitalism, but let us at least speak of commercial capital being applied to industry. Now, commercial capital, yeah? You mean I wind up in five minutes? You have. Only five? Yes. I, I go up to 50 minutes, yeah? Because it's a, it's a keynote lecture. No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> now, this is a good case of primitive accumulation being cut short. <laughs> anyway. So how much time have I taken? You've only taken <coughs> Sorry? Yeah, okay. Um, so he said, you know, Hauser says, let's at least talk about commercial capital being applied to industry. Now, commercial capital applied to industry is not industrial capital in the sense in which the owners of modern large-scale industry have come to personify this. It seems more plausible to reserve the term industrial capital for enterprises that were run by manufacturers who were no longer merchants. In the US, this transition was still ongoing in the 19th century cotton industry, and their industrial capital proper only truly emerged in the shape of the large vertically integrated enterprises in oil, steel, chemicals, rubber, and so on, that came about towards the very end of the 19th century. The same is true of the development of industry on the continent. For example, in Germany, where industrial capitalism exploded in the early 1870s, as bankers like Bismarck's friend Bleichroder came around to financing that great expansion. That was between 1870 and 73. In any case, the merchant-controlled manufacturing enterprises of the late medieval and early modern periods cannot be seen as industrial capital in this stricter modern sense. Okay, I'm sort of willing to, to kind of, you know, basically argue this point that um, manufacturing and the manufacturing period do not embody industrial capital in our sense, in our contemporary sense of the word. They embody merchant capitalism or merchant controlled industries. In volume three of Capital, there's a passing reference to the manner and form in which commercial capital operates where it dominates production directly. The two examples Marx cites of this are first, colonial trade in general, the so-called colonial system, that is a vast transatlantic commercial system, which among other things revitalized slavery as a modern development. And secondly, the operations of the former Dutch East India Company. So those are two Marxist sort of, you know, two substantial trade sectors in both of which Marx seemed to think commercial capital was active in new, more direct ways. As important as this text is, another one, namely where Marx says industrial capital has value for them, even the highest value, Marx says about the mercantilists in that Grundrisse passage I quoted earlier, because it creates mercantile capital and the latter via circulation becomes money. Now it's this creation of mercantile capital via industrial capital, that is via production, that forms the stable heart of the pre-industrial regime. And I'd like to suggest that it's plausible to see merchant or commercial capitalism as a system of accumulation where merchant capitals are characterized 
by a tendential drive to subordinate production directly. Of course, since the biggest commercial firms are always highly diversified business enterprises that moved capital between finance, trade, and manufacturing, the expansion of mercantile capital in this pure sense was part of more complex strategies of accumulation. It might make more sense, therefore, to see merchant capitalism as characterized by what I call sectors, of which the four or five main ones were, one, the Verlag-based manufacturing that first sprawled across large parts of the countryside of Western and Central Europe as early as the 13th century, reaching an absolute zenith in the 18th. Two, the big concentrated money markets which moved in sequence historically from Venice to Antwerp and then through the Genoese network to Amsterdam and finally to London. Three, the commercial investments that went into trade sectors such as the Atlantic and Asia. In the Atlantic, the productive capital financed by merchants took the form of plantations and slavery. And four, the produce trades that were tip the typical form of British mercantile capitalism in the 19th century and characterized by advances to household producers circulated either directly, as with the government's monopoly of opium, or more generally through local brokers. In many-headed Hydra, Leinbauer and Redeker described shipping as, quote, a mode of production that united all of the others in the sphere of circulation. I, I really like that, a mode of production in the sphere of circulation. Um, and since most shipping magnates were also merchants, at least before the emergence of specialized ship owning in the late 18th century, shipping could likewise be seen as a purely merchant capitalist sector, a fifth one. Now, the point about these sectors is not that there's a finite list of them. I mean, we can carry on and on. And in fact, we heard a paper this afternoon which talks about contracting um, you know, the relationships between merchant capital and the state or merchants and the state, which it seems to me that you can expand this list. I'm simply outlining what I see as the main sectors of merchant capitalist activity before the 19th century. The flexibility and sophistication of the bigger merchant firms lay not just in their minute knowledge of international markets, but in their ability to move between sectors and to combine them in various ways. On the other hand, the vast mass of lesser commercial capitals did tend to specialize within particular sectors. So, um, you know, diversification is, is essentially a characteristic of big merchant capitals, not of the smaller guys. Today, we are in a much better position to flesh out some of the more abstract intuitions of Marxists like Probrzezinski. When he argued that the whole period of existence, it's a quote, the whole period of existence of merchant capital should be regarded as a period of primitive accumulation of the systematic plundering of petty production. What he had in mind were sectors one, three, and four. Basically, Verlag, which was my first sector, plus the colonial trades, uh, you know, the Atlantic trade and the, Asian, the, the produce trades. By plunder, he simply meant what Argiri Emmanuel would later call unequal exchange. That is, enforced control over terms of trade in a world marked by mobility of capital, immobility of labor. That conjunction is crucial. It's only very recently that we've begun to see the, you know, the mobility of labor in a, emerging in a significant way. But if you have that conjunction, it seems to me, then you have to agree that there is an unequal exchange in Emmanuel's sense. For example, by holding the wages of weavers down, as all merchant capitalists were able to do when they monopolized raw materials. But Probrzezinski situated himself in a tradition of historiography shaped by Franz Mehring's vision of merchant capital as, quote, the revolutionary force of the 14th, 15th, and 16th centuries. Now, this was not Marx's view. It was a deviant, a non-standard Marxist view represented in, in, in Mehring's uh, writings on Germany. A revolutionary force of the 14th, 15th, and 16th centuries, one that, quote, not only created modern absolutism, but also transformed the medieval classes of society. In Russia, this strand of history was, of course, best represented in the work of M.N. Pokrovsky, and Pro Probrzezinski showers praise on him when dealing with primitive accumulation, despite the fact that there was a long-standing, a long-running battle between Trotsky and Pokrovsky. Pokrovsky had reviewed Trotsky's, um, you know, parts of, parts of his history of the Russian Revolution quite harshly, and a polemic emerged between them. Despite that, Probrzezinski praises him, praises Pokrovsky's work in, in the new economics. It is also there, in other words, this particular strand of the history of historiography of capitalism is there in Isaac Rubin's lectures in the history of economic thought. 
which I think Rubin gave in the late 20s and the late 1920s. In fact, the translator of that is present here, Don Filzer. There you are. Okay. So Pokrovsky himself continued to maintain as late as 1929 that, quote, commercial capitalism played a huge role in the creation of the Russian monarchy. It created this Russian absolute monarchy. Now, I, I don't personally believe this. I'm simply stating or rather overstating a point, which is that there, were, there was a whole generation of Marxists much earlier who took commercial capitalism more seriously than we tend to do, to do today. So Pokrovsky said it created this Russian absolute monarchy, a position he was soon forced to ret ret retract. Thus, when later historians like Georges Lefebvre posited a crucial, quote, symbiosis between the state and the merchants, and argued that it was the collusion between commerce and the state that promoted the development of capitalism, which was the stand that Lefebvre took in the transition debates, or when Mousinier suggested that the absolute monarchies and large-scale capitalism were functions of each other, the same dissident historiography was being articulated. Indeed, Morris Dobb himself devotes a whole chapter of studies in the development of capitalism to what he calls capital accumulation and mercantilism. He argues there that, the, that mercantilism was, quote, essentially the economic policy of an age of primitive accumulation. Quote, a system of state-regulated exploitation through trade, which played a highly important role in the adolescence of capitalist interest, industry. The peculiar nexus between state and capital reflected in a fluid array of mercantilist policies that have their origins in the later Middle Ages and reach their culmination in the 17th century seems to me to best describe the political economy of primitive accumulation. It's the state capital nexus that matters most of all. It's not one or the other taken in isolation, but the way in which they're reinforcing each other and enhancing the power you know, of the other. Now, before coming to this, however, let me say a bit about three, at least three of the five sectors that I've listed above. And the ones I'll, I'll talk about are putting out and the slave, the slave plantations and the produce trades. These are the three sectors I'll say something briefly about. Putting out networks were, quote, the first hard evidence of a merchant capitalism, Brodel wrote in Wheels of Commerce. <coughs> Wolfgang von Stromer, I'm not sure where he stands politically, but he's an, he's an amazing historian. Wolfgang von Stromer has argued that Verlag was the most widespread type of economic organization in Europe before the advent of large-scale industry. And it's grossly neglected, you know, the putting out system, grossly neglected. The textile industries of the 12th to 16th centuries and later were entirely based on it. It allowed for what he calls, quote, export-oriented standardized mass production, and in South Germany, for a concentration of production in whole industrial basins, like the kind of basin around Nuremberg. In London in the 17th century, as Bayer shows, quote, big city merchants organized craft production in the suburbs and countryside, a development, he argues, that led naturally to the Industrial Revolution because, as Dobbs states, and Bayer quotes Dobbs here, the capitalist merchant manufacturer had an increasingly close interest in promoting improvements in the instruments and methods of production. This is Dobbs speaking. He's, as, he's as, ascribing a certain kind of modernity to merchant capital. In France, concentrations of capital were in commercial form. Lefebvre writes, millions of peasants worked for city merchants. Picardie and Beauvais in the north of France became the base of a rural-based textile industry controlled by, quote, powerful merchants. Putting out le travail à façon was widespread in the Swiss textile industry of the early 19th century, as Vesera's work shows. And outwork was still the predominant form of industrial organization in Britain in the 1820s. So as late as the 1820s, that is barely four, four decades before Marx is writing Capital, the predominant form of industrial organization is outwork. Beithel, Duncan Beithel, who notes this, cites Mendel's argument that a so-called proto-industry created, quote, an accumulation of capital in the hands of merchant entrepreneurs, making possible the adoption of machine industry with its relatively higher capital costs. Finally, it's worth noting Maxine Berg's criticism that Marx's model of manufactures was, quote, useful in highlighting the features of some 18th century industry, but it was a linear model and failed to deal adequately with the features of the putting out system and other related forms of domestic manufacture, which is one reason why the whole issue of reproduction has been so largely neglected in the mainstream Marxist tradition, because you don't take putting out seriously. You won't, you won't look at the household and, and the way domestic labor, demography, and so on enter into the picture. 
Marx says very little about putting out. Now, the American plantations were capitalist creations par excellence, Brodel notes in Wheels of Commerce, and then clarifies it was European trade that commanded production and output overseas. London's expansion in the late 17th century was fueled by the plantation trades, which is restoration London essentially uh, grows, grows fat or grows rich on the plantation trades. But to start with, it's worth noting that in terms of both capital value and overseas trade, the slave system was expanding, not declining at the turn of the 19th century. That's a quotation from Drescher. Twice as much money was invested in the slave trade during 1791 to 1807 at the height of the abolitionist agitation as in the agitation-free decade 1761 to 1780, which is a paradox. British slave trade capital, Drescher argues, rose sharply at the end of the 18th century. There was little vocal opposition to the trade between the 1650s and the loss of America, not even from Quakers. That's a quote from Christopher Hill. In the plantations themselves, next to slavery, the critical relation of production was merchant economic control over planters. That for me is the essential relation of production other than the obvious one of, of slave labor. The total sum owing to London merchants by West Indian sugar planters, for example, was several million pounds by 1770, roughly as much as the total mercantile debt owed by the mainland colonies to London at this time, which was three million pounds. Of course, we have to translate this into contemporary uh, currency values, there will be phenomenal sums of money, right? If you translate three million pounds in 1770 into today's currency values. In Cuba, the Matanza sugar economy was largely financed by the Havana merchant houses through so-called uh, refacion contracts, which guaranteed sugar supplies for export, essentially a Cuban form of the advance contract. The bigger merchant establishments, such as the Torrientes, were the main accumulators of Cuban capital. Yet this is not the end of the story. When Baron Alphonse de Rothschild visited Cuba in 1849, it was not the Havana merchant houses, but the London merchant banks, he claimed, who are making all the profit, all of the profit from commissions, credits, and consignation. Quote, the sugar business here is the monopoly of the Havana exporters. However, they are not doing the most important or weighty business. This is being done by Bearings, Coots, Fruling, and Goshen in London. So this is a merchant banker telling us from a direct visit to Cuba in the 1840s, that it's the merchant banks who are creaming off most of the profits from the sugar industry. And that's the London merchant banks. And for roughly the same reasons, in 1860, a North Carolina paper described New York as, quote, the northern state which had profited most by the slave labor of the South, thanks to the commercial ties that existed between them. Eric Williams was surely right to claim, quote, the commercial capitalism of the 18th century developed the wealth of Europe by means of slavery and monopoly. And to say that in so doing, it, namely commercial capitalism, helped to create the industrial capitalism of the 19th century. Williams describes a historical dialectic similar to primitive accumulation, but one in which one form of capitalism feeds into the expansion of another and destroys itself as it does so, except that it didn't, as Drescher's critique showed since slavery continued to expand. That's the main qualification of Williams's model, the one that Drescher made in, in a book called Econocide. Finally, it's worth noting that in theories of surplus value, Marx focuses on the planters rather than on the London houses that finance this whole web of trade. When he wrote the business in which slaves are used is conducted by capitalists, he seemed to have the planters in mind. But in the Atlantic trades, there was a fundamental shift to the commission system from the 1660s. British merchants supplied American planters with a wide range of mercantile and quasi-banking services, including the provision of shipping, insurance, and eventually finance. The commission system, which was overwhelmingly centered in London, came to dominate the greater part of British Atlantic trade. This explains how, quote, at least half of the total for Jamaica's import and exports made its way invisibly back to England, in freight charges, insurance, commissions, interest on debts, transfers of money, etc., In the invisible earnings are the, always the mainstay, the backbone of, 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 of Britain's balance of payments. It's the invisible earnings because they often run huge deficits on current account, yeah? All in all, the net benefit for England 
in the year 1773 was getting on for one and a half million. In other words, uh, for that particular year, one and a half million just in terms of mercantile profit, million pounds. In London, as in Bordeaux, the proceeds of colonial trade, Brodel says, were transformed into trading houses, banks, and state bonds, which is a way of saying we're still dealing with the accumulation of mercantile capital, the expansion or the self-expansion of mercantile capital, confirming Rothschild's point about where the profits of Cuban sugar went. Thus, Marx's expression, conducted by capitalists, should really refer us back to a conglomeration of commercial interests at the heart of which lay the London West India houses, whose judgments or instructions to the island agencies were essentially based on city news and outlook. So depending on how the city interpreted the economic situation, they would or would not um, expand or contract their loans. Finally, a third sector. So I've just referred briefly now to putting out of Ferlag and, and, and to the plantations, a third sector, the produce trades. British merchants who financed household production in India and West Africa, and again, reproduction comes into this part, part of the picture, in the 19th century did so through a system of advances. Mercantile advances embodied a circulation of capital. These were not transactions in the sphere of simple circulation, but a means of integrating peasant household labor into the capitalist world market. Chayanov called this form of accumulation vertical capitalist concentration. Okay? I mean, I'm being, I'm being self-consciously and ludicrously heterodox um, throughout this paper, right? So I'm, I'm bringing Chayanov in and all sorts of people in, but, but Chayanov, I mean, after all, you know, people construct this ridiculous opposition between Lenin and Chayanov and so on, but Chayanov calls it vertical capitalist concentration. By this, he meant that, quote, while in a production sense, concentration in agriculture is scarcely ever reflected in the formation of new large-scale undertakings, in an economic sense, capitalism as a general economic system makes great headway in agriculture. I think that's a crucial, crucial distinction, what Chayanov calls the production sense versus the economic sense. Agriculture, he wrote, quote, becomes subject to trading capitalism, what I've been calling commercial capitalism, that sometimes in the form of very large scale commercial undertakings draws masses of scattered peasant farms into its sphere of influence and having bound these small-scale commodity producers to the market, economically subordinates them to its influence. So he's allowing for small-scale commodity production, but he's positing their kind of subordination or, you know, to, to these large trading firms. The example he cited was of the large cotton merchants of the Knoop family, that's K-N-O-O-P, Knoop family, uh, big cotton traders. The need to lay out money in advance made heavy demands for working capital which meant that the produce trades were characterized over time by a growing concentration and centralization of capital with giant firms like UAC, that's the trading arm of Unilever, dominating very large shares of the produce market in British West Africa. It was this sort of vertical concentration that sustained the largely British and French trades in palm oil, raw cotton, opium, wheat, tea, teak, rice, coffee, jute, rubber, groundnut, and so on all of which saw major periods of expansion in the mid to late 19th century and early 20th. I mean, we tend to associate the 19th century with industrial capitalism, but it's also a period of phenomenal commercial expansion. It's in the middle decades of the 19th century, largely linked to industrial capital because that's the main, that's the main market now for all these products. Now on very small farms, gross output per acre has always been the important calculation for households as Krishna Bharadwaj showed for India back in the 70s. Very small cultivators, that's her expression, concentrate on high value cash crops with a high labor input per acre. That's the typical pattern. They go for crops which exemplify these particular features, which is that they are high value on the one hand, and they fetch a high price in the market, and they high labor input per acre. They involve uh, you know, considerable absorption of family labor. Now, jute was a prime example of this forcing up of labor intensity, as Chayanov characterized the economic behavior of farm households. And of course, the key to making money out of jute manufacturing, both in Calcutta and Dundee, was to buy raw jute at as low a price as possible. That's a quote from Stewart's book on jute. In parts of China, the equivalent crop that's equivalent to jute in Bengal was tobacco the most valuable of all cash crops. As Chen Han Sheng described it, 
in a valuable monograph from 1939 called Industrial Capital and Chinese Peasants. Except that here it was a large vertically integrated industrial firm, BAT or British American Tobacco, that enforced the sort of price domination that held large numbers of peasant households in thrall. Prices were dictated by the company's foreign leaf experts who were specially flown in, flown into China from the US South, just as the East India, the English East India Company had back in the 18th century fixed the rates to be paid for a wide assortment of peace goods from Bengal at their headquarters in London two years before actual delivery, with no allowance for price increases that weavers had to contend with in the intervening period. And just as the French commercial houses that financed groundnut cultivation in Senegal fixed the prices to be paid to producers at their head offices in Bordeaux. So price fixation was an extremely centralized operation. Local producers had no control over it, no bargaining occurred. You know, there was, there was no kind of, resistance did occur, but it, wasn't, it didn't take the form of any kind of negotiations between uh, merchant capital and the household. So the so-called self-exploitation of the peasantry fed directly into higher rates of surplus value on these commercial capitals and through them on the total social capital. Is the general rate of profit raised by the higher profit rate made by capital invested in foreign trade and in colonial trade in particular, Marx had asked in volume three and replied, of course, in the affirmative. You know, in other words, here is the essence of the integration of world economy. The fact, the fact that, the, the, that the high rates of surplus value in the plantation sector, in the produce trades and so on, feed back into the general into the into the equal, equalizing the rate of profit at higher levels uh, worldwide so they, they go into the formation of the general rate of profit and note that Emmanuel's theory of unequal exchange presupposes equalization of profits with unequal rates of surplus value and the latter thanks to the immobility of the labor factor I mean once that is dropped once that is dropped then of course this model doesn't work but unequal tr unequal exchange in his sense depends on this conjunction so the expansion of mercantile capital was thus the standard form of capitalist accumulation for centuries together, even if this history has never been properly constructed. Any historian who does so, in other words, writes a, a history of capitalism, would have to start with the fierce struggles between Venetian and Genoese capitalists for domination of the Byzantine markets in Constantinople, the Aegean and the Black Sea. But leaving that aside, I mean, that's a struggle that goes back to the 12th and 13th centuries. Leaving that aside, it's quite clear that in the 17th century, a major transformation took place as the state stepped in to extend its formal backing to capital and the competition of capitals took on a much stronger national form. So that's the hallmark of the 17th century as, as David Hume realized when he referred to the jealousy of trade, the jealousy of trade being uh, peculiar to the 17th and 18th centuries. If Spanish mercantilism was a long lament on Spain's failure to develop, the mercantilisms of France, Holland, and England were quite different in character, as commercial competition, in the words of von Schmoller, even in times nominally of peace, degenerated into a state of undeclared hostility. It plunged nations into one war after another and gave all wars a turn in the direction of trade, industry, and colonial gain. A fascinating passage in volume three refers to the commercial struggles of the 17th and 18th centuries as the industrial struggle of the nations on the world market. Oh, okay. And sees the intervention of the state as seeking to accelerate the development of capital by compulsion. And I'm not going to go on with this particular passage, but essentially it's about primitive accumulation. What's interesting here in this volume three passage is that he doesn't use the word either you know, primary accumulation or primitive accumulation. He drops the term entirely. It's possible that had Marx wanted to rewrite Volume one, we might not even end up with this conference because there wouldn't be the term. So, um, in, the, in the five minutes that I, I've got left, I think much of my argument is now condensed in the paper, which is actually accessible. Um, what I do is go on to the state and describe the, describe the uh, expansion of capitalism as as much a function of the needs of government as of capital. This is the crucial point, that it's not just like a one-sided unilateral expansion driven by the needs of, of private businesses and, and private merchants, but governments, the, the modern state has a substantial stake uh, in the expansion of capitalism 
uh, for reasons that I've, I've gone into there, I, I'm not going to say. I end up, I end up by briefly describing, um, you know, primitive accumulation, not primitive socialist accumulation, primitive accumulation in in Russia as as a as a you know as basically as a case of primitive accumulation, but referring there to um, let me just let me just read that bit by way of conclusion. Whatever we think of these views, and I, basically when I'm, what I mean by these views is Hilferding's extreme view of the state as essentially autonomous vis-a-vis -vis all classes, all right? Essentially independent. It's a, it's a power of its own. It's not reducible to class interests. It has its own interests, all right? That's Hilferding's extreme view. To a large extent, Sartre reflects a similar view of the state uh, in the critique of dialectical reason. So I've said whatever we think of these views, it's clear that the prevailing instrumentalist views of the nature of the modern state will simply not work in trying to describe its role in the era of primitive accumulation. There was no coherent mercantile interest for the state to be simply a pawn in the hands of this or that sector of capital. All right. Moreover, as Wallerstein says, the growth of the national debt reflected the growing autonomous interests of the states as economic actors. In the case of Stalin's Russia, arguably the last great episode of primitive accumulation in modern history, it is even less possible to derive the decisions of the state from any pre-formed classes, because there were none. In the 1920s and early 30s, there weren't any pre-established classes in Russia. Under Stalin, the methods of primitive accumulation ranged widely from dispossessing millions of peasants and breaking the resistance of an organized working class, even forcing it back into seriality, to the use of mass repression and terror as instruments of accumulation, the paroxysm of violence uh, in 1937, the banning of abortion and revival of the cult of the family, manipulations of public opinion, and so on and so forth. All of this was part of Stalinist primitive accumulation. Now, much of this has been brilliantly documented in Don Filser's series of monographs, which covers a very wide span of Russia's industrial experience. The more abstract elements of analysis are given in volume two of Sartre's critique, and interestingly there he cites what must remain one of the more vivid images of Stalinist primitive accumulation, namely John Scott's account of the monstrous squandering of labor and production. No, I've lost my... That occurred at the, at the giant metallurgical complex at Magnitogorsk in the Ural industrial region. I hope I've pronounced it correctly, Magnitogorsk. Where between, yeah? Where between 1928 and 1932, Nearly a quarter of a million people came, the vast bulk of them voluntarily, seeking work, bread cards, better conditions. That's the di a direct upshot of the collect forced collectivization of, you know, you dispossess millions of peasants, you force them into a kind of incohate labor market, which is essentially what this massive industrial complex in the Ural region draws upon. Now here, Scott, who worked as an electric welder for five years in the 1930s, saw those masses of uprooted peasants create a gigantic plant and city within five years. Under Stalin, he wrote, the tempo of construction was such that millions of men and women starved, froze, oh, and were brutalized by inhuman labor. This had nothing to do with socialism, of course, since it presupposed the disarming of the factory committees, which had occurred under the Bolsheviks very soon after the revolution. And later in the 1930s, it presupposed that peculiar reciprocity of incarnations between Stalin and the bureaucracy, which Sartre tries hard to fathom in his second volume. That's his expression, reciprocity of incarnations. If there were limits to Stalin's control of the Soviet bureaucracy, it remains true nonetheless that the bureaucracy saw itself as an incarnation of Stalin and of his frenetic drive to make Russia catch up with the West at any cost. Thanks.